Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we're going to do another unboxing episode, but it's a little bit different. I've got one guitar with a short tale to tell, and then some very interesting memorabilia and other future things. First things first here, let's start with our guitar. So this is the Les Paul that I was talking about in that ES330 episode that I kind of wanted one of these things again. And since it was a package deal for two guitars, it just happened to work out. Inside here is another slash Brazilian dream. However, this one's a little bit different. When I had first gotten this, yeah, I'm sorry, you're getting a secondhand unboxing because I needed to check this in to get the guy his money. It was pretty heavily used, like not trashed and abused, just the fact that there was a bunch of fingerprints and gunk on this thing. So the night I got this, I just went to town and polished this bad boy up. So it is looking so good now. I'm very pleased with the way this turned out. The frets are ultra shiny. I decided not to film the cleaning process on this because it's not fun to film everything. I do it for your guys' enjoyment. I would much rather just do my own thing and not have to but it's fun documenting my life's journey as well as you know getting to share it with you guys so in case you don't know about the brazilian dream you can learn all about it in this episode had it not been for the demo shop blowing out 18 to 20 of these things i probably would have never even took on this because that's what kind of reproved the market was the demo shop layoffs i guess you could say but, uh, as far as I'm aware, looking at the old sold numbers, this was actually an original retail model because it's number 60. So I threw it up on Reverb. It's technically the cheapest one on Reverb, but it's still what I consider a premium price. I'm honestly not that in a hurry to sell this because I kind of want one of these for my own collection now that they're known as underdogs. Pretty much the only bad thing about this guy is our bottom strap button is completely loose. And when I say a strap button's loose, it's not that it just needs retightened. I can use a screwdriver. I'm saying there's nothing left for it to grip. So that technically needs filled and redrilled. Yes, you can do toothpick methods and whatnot, but I would rather just get it done in a more professional way or just leave it alone for the next buyer to address it the way that they want to. And then the other thing is there's like a small ding on the back. I just love these green interior lifting cases. They look so cool and the fretboard darkened up nicely. And yeah, that is true Brazilian rosewood. So if you're looking for a lightly played one, you know where to find it. But to be honest, this is probably in better condition than most factory original ones, would be my guess. We get to have lots of fun. Let's start with this FedEx package. We'll have to be careful how we open this one because what's in here is another one for my new old stock parts collection, if I remember correctly. But this was a really special find. Like, I am really pumped to have these in my collection because I just recently missed out on some Tim Shaw's that were new old stock, right? So I thought that would be pretty tough to find those again, but I think what I found here is even more rare. A complete set of super dirt pickups. Apparently that's what they were called. So these are double cream, gold bobbin, dirty fingers pickups in the original replacement boxes, which is just mind boggling. Like to find double cream, dirty fingers, new old stock. That's cool. Like I would have been fine with any other color as well, but this was a great find. Yeah, sure, maybe the boxes aren't perfect, but I honestly don't care about that because you can doctor them up pretty easily to look good. But now the question is, does it have the paperwork within it? I didn't ask questions, I just bought it because that's what I've just kind of come to find out when it comes to these harder to find parts. So it's not looking like this has any manuals, but we do have some sort of foam in here, although I'm not entirely sure that's original. Now, is this true new old stock? I don't know, looking at it, it looks like it got pretty dirty. And the way that this lead looks kind of makes me think it might have been installed in something, but I don't truly care if it's new old stock as long as it's in clean condition. And it's got the cool box that has the correct label on it telling me that it was an original replacement part. And you can't forget the all-important screws, too. This other one appears to be in better and cleaner shape. So very cool. I'm not sure if that's an original price tag sticker or like aftermarket, but also kind of nice to see. The collection's coming along nicely. Next up here, let's see what's in this box. Packing peanuts. And oh my, now I remember what's in here. This is a trem bar. But this is not a tremolo unit you've probably ever seen. 
This thing right here is such a Frankenstein beast, but it actually is original Gibson equipment that came stock on very few Gibson guitars. So when Gibson started to offer vibrolas in the 80s, there were three different options. There was the Super Tune, which was the regular Kaler, the Master Tune, that was done up in 1984 only, I don't blame you if you've never seen that, and then the very shortly lived Pro Tune. And that's what this bad boy is. The reason why you probably never even knew this thing existed is because they are a surface mount tremolo system created by Schaller. So you could technically remove this off the guitar without a trace. In theory, I actually haven't had a stock one to see is there any like slight footprint that might be left by this, but it did not require any giant route like a Kaler. But pretty much only the Kalers lasted more than a year. These other ones, I guess maybe they were just too confusing. <laughs> but if you have a guitar that came stock with this, it's one of the few Gibsons to come stock with a roller style bridge. Then you kind of have elements of the TP6 tailpiece here. Has some Kaler like vibes here. But basically, it mounts to your guitar using your stop bar studs right here, and then it just goes over your bridge studs here. I mean, I actually haven't had one on a guitar, so I'll fill you guys more in once I have hands-on experience. But I thought this was an interesting piece of history that I found on eBay, which apparently it's missing like some mounting screws or something, but basically your strings go into here, and then they have the tensioners there, and then it just goes over the roller bridge and it's just like normal. Maybe I'll make a YouTube short on this when I have some more information to share, or a full video if it's that crazy. Continuing on here, let's see what's in this green box. I don't think it's a 56 volt charger. I don't remember buying that. But I do remember buying this. So this is late 90s, early 2000s Gibson case candy. They used to give you these things with their custom art historic guitars. It includes an old timey Gibson truss rod instruction manual. You got a really cool black braided cable, a cool polishing cloth, and then a whole mess of other stuff in here, which are basically just hang tags telling you about the Les Paul model professional's attention, the iconic Mr. Dealer reprint card, and some other various instructions on how to set up the pickups and tune a Matic bridge. So needless to say, it's some pretty cool stuff, but normally these are not kept with the guitar because A, it's a very usable cable, and B, people didn't fully understand the collectability of Case Candy back then. It's like the early days of the COA. There's a reason why most of them got lost. So I picked this thing up because there's a guy selling a whole bunch of them. I had recently drug my feet on a really cool maple syrup model, Les Paul, that you can learn about in this episode. It was a Canadian exclusive, and because it didn't have this, I drug my feet long enough that someone else bought it, and I was heartbroken the rest of the day. <laughs> then lo and behold, uh, I was looking through my parts yesterday. I already have a set of this, so I don't know what I was thinking. But what's inside priority box number two? The box says Schaller's, so let's see, did I buy some Schaller tuners? Let's find out. Yes, okay, I remember. These were an absolute steal on eBay one night. You always gotta watch those auctions. If you know about obscure parts, sometimes you can get a great deal. So these are original pearl tip shawlers. So this is what you find on like Gibson Spotlight Special and on the, I think it's the 335S Standard. It's one of them, I can't remember at this point in time. It's like the only two models that you would find this thing on. The Spotlight ones are a little bit less see-through, so I think this definitely originally came from one of those 335 5S guitars, but it's a nice beautiful clean set. It's got the washers and the screw in bushing and even the screws. So it's like, yes, please. I will win that auction. Now let's see what's in this prime box. Wow, that's chunky. Inside here, sleeps. Uh oh, it's my kid's Christmas presents. <laughs> this isn't supposed to be here. But that is a pretty cool fish. Let's try that again. We've got a mystery box. I don't think it's more Christmas presents. Oh, okay, wow, these got here fast. So I was telling you guys uh, a couple of unboxing episodes back that I was buying some new old stock, like 2000s-ish parts, just because, you know, they're relatively inexpensive nowadays because people will still be buying these and just put them on their new guitars because, hey, it's kind of hard to find sealed Gibson parts. So I thought, if I'm collecting the 70s and 80s stuff when it's like at the peak value, I might as well start on this stuff when it's still cheap. So I've got some nice strap buttons here that are still beautifully sealed. The nice thing about this era is I actually have a very nice checklist here of everything I need to find. I've got what looks like a neck pickup ring here because it's very thin with the screws. We have a black switch tip still sealed. 
Although it looks like the vacuum seal is starting to lose some of its suction. Either that or it was just never that good to begin with. We've got some beautiful speed knobs. Now what's kind of cool about these is the fact that after 1985, speed knobs stop aging. So to actually get period correct ones, if you're trying to restore a 2000s model, you would actually need to find one that's new old stock in this packaging to know that's exactly what you were looking for. But not only did I have speed knobs, I also got the historic style top hats, non-reflector. They had 28 of these things, but the price wasn't good enough to buy all those. I don't need that many Les Paul custom pick guards. And uh, a, a duplicate, I guess. Probably bought two of these because it's more likely that you're going to need these than the speed knobs. Not many models used a golden speed knob. Unless you're trying to like Randy Rhodes out your custom or something. And what is our beautiful last part? Ooh, the black version of the same knobs. Another one of those ones that was not used that often. But hey, a nice set of parts. However, I, I feel like I'm missing some. So I'll have to double check that order. But now I know these are some good finds that'll take a little bit longer to talk about. So a viewer of the show graciously sent me a link to a website that I've heard of. I just never actually used it. And to be honest, it was not that good of a website <laughs> as far as browsing and whatnot. And I can't even remember the name of the site, but they said, hey, this dude has a whole bunch of old Gibson memorabilia that I think you would like to check out. So I, I did it and I found some pretty cool stuff. I mean, look at this. It's the USA Map Guitar poster. I've got to say that's pretty cool just due to the sheer size. Now I paid $30 for it, which I, I think was too much, but eventually one day, I will find this prototype USA map guitar that has the toggle switch in a very cool location instead of down here looking dumb. Although I'd argue that output jack looks a little suspicious. But I thought this would look good behind any other regular map guitar that I eventually also own. So it's just kind of a, you know, future museum stuff. It, it'd be nice to have. I don't think I've ever seen a big display one like this. I've seen the small newspaper ones. Those are pretty common. But everything else I bought from this guy in this box, he, he gave me a fantastic deal. So I'm not worried about what I paid. But wait until you see some of this other stuff. We've got giant old notebooks. Just kidding. It's a Gibson custom shop calendar. Now, editor, just blur this. We don't need to open that can of worms again. <laughs> <laughs> My show's about guitars. I don't want to talk politics. But if you've been watching the show, we've actually seen this recently on a Les Paul studio that had a weird early COA that used this exact same style font. But this is a calendar from 1993. So naturally, I wanted to see everything that was on here. So does that look familiar to you guys? Yeah, we've talked about the penthouse models. That's cool to see that in a new old stock format. But look at the Italian dream here. I don't think that's ever shown up. Here we've got some sort of a Harley Davidson type thing going on. Well, for being a calendar, so far it sucks at telling you the date. <laughs> but apparently there's a Beverly Hills version. J2000 custom. Honestly, I think uh, some of this could just make for other good content. There's a Sparkle Sunburst J200. Las Vegas 2. I think I have seen this one in the wild. Whoa, what's going on here? We've got some spiders. Looks like this lady has a... Uh, is that an orange sparkle elegant? Oh my goodness, that is such a beautiful sweatshirt. If anybody has that, please let me know. I would love that. And it looks like we got a banjo. A couple of other cool guys here. Super 400 with diamond F holes. We have seen, I think, a white one of those show up. Got some Ultimas, and that's kind of a strange looking Les Paul custom there. Almost looks like a Chipson. Oh good, we've got some more information on that particular one here. Got a banjo, controversial banjo, banjos. There it is! Yeah, even more proof that it was repainted. This thing's actually shown up and it has different colors on it now because somebody thought the all gold was boring. But if I remember correctly, I think this is for sale for like $50,000. We've done a wiring on it. That's kind of a cool 355 type thing. So yeah, that's pretty cool, 1993, the first partial year of the real custom shop. However, we also have one from 1992 that's a little bit better aged. And oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm not showing you guys this one because... <laughs> 
there's some history in here that I even I didn't know about. That's why I loved finding this. So I think we just need to do a, a, a separate upload on these. I'll take some nice scans so we can actually look at these things. But wow, that's a cool find. And we're not even done yet. We've got some more fun stuff. Besides the calendars, I love that I own this now, a custom color key for the 90s historic collection. So we can see all of these beautiful colors from natural to antique natural, antique gold, heritage dark, faded cherry, all the cool colors that you can find on Firebirds. And it's an original one. We've got an elegant pamphlet. The ever cool L5 Studio with all its nice colors. The pretty elegant, the Catalina. Then if we can believe this date, it's a 1999 historic collection catalog. It has a whole bunch of other cool things that we can uh, check out on another day. But now, I keep talking about my museum, right? You know, museums need a unique way to display things. So I actually found a company willing to send me some samples. Now, I'm not sponsored to talk about these guys, but I, I think they're called True View or something like that. So I'm worried that by displaying the guitars, they're gonna lose their color because of UV light and whatnot. So there's special glasses that you can buy that don't do that. And it also cuts down on the glare. So like this is really glaring. I wouldn't want that. This is not too bad, but then over here it almost gets to nothing. I find it kind of ironic that it says best product down here, anti-static resistance and scratch, but on the demo it's the only one that got scratched. But yeah, that is a huge difference here. Now this one's not as UV protectant, but wow, this glass is perfectly clear. It's like there's almost nothing there. I, I would kind of actually prefer that one, I think. I mean, look how that just almost goes away. Now it looks like we have some sort of a, a static electricity test. I'm not sure I necessarily need to worry about that displaying electric guitars, but I guess it's good to know that's an option. And now we have a beautiful display of how they can glaze the glass differently with a glazed donut. So one side, once again, reflective, this one not as much, and you can really just tell the color difference here. Seeing this on camera does it no justice. It almost feels unfair, like is this one really more vibrant than that? But I think it just all comes down to not being reflective. So I'm still trying to figure out how I want to do my museum. I'm almost thinking maybe I get these guys to partner with like TKL to make me cool custom see-through guitar cases, and then we just like hang them up on the wall from there. That way we can still open them and enjoy them if we need to, but we can also see and appreciate them them if we need to, but without all the dust of a traditional display. And they're probably more securely mounted like that. And as an added bonus, I could sell them at my museum, custom brand them, then you can use it at home. <laughs> now it looks like we've got one last example here with like a little record. So seeing all this in the flesh is really eye-opening for me. I, d I definitely need to uh, get museum grade glass here. And I'm sorry guys, I had to take so many sponsorships, but building a guitar museum, uh, that's not cheap. Buying the guitars for the museum, that's not cheap. Displaying them in a way that preserves them for future generations and not get all sun faded and disgusting. Like if I have 500 guitars in the museum and it costs me $400 to frame each of them up, that might even be a low estimate. That's 200,000 bucks right there and that's not including anything else, not the mini golf facility or any of that. So seeing all this in the flesh helps me understand and gets me really motivated to end up doing this. But anyways, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.